On their last mission to Duna, the crew found something that was, to say the least, rather unusual. But as conflict rages in Southeast Kerbin, there are few funds available to solve this mystery. I am Echo 3, and let's continue discussing the Cold War. With the regional conflict still ongoing, the members of the Central Kerbin Alliance Network prepare for the possibility of an all-out war with the Communists. And if war like that ever happens, it may be difficult to use conventional runways. So several nations have come together and requested that the research and development arm here come up with a fighter concept that is able to take off and land vertically. A fighter that is able to take off and land vertically would be useful for more than just improvised runways, but also for carrier operations. Up until this point, there's a reason a fighter like this has never been developed. A big reason for that is an engine would need to be powerful enough to give this craft a thrust-to-weight ratio greater than one. This could be done by taking a more traditional style jet and adding several engines facing downward just to produce lift. But that would be adding a lot of extra mass to the aircraft. So what engineers have planned for this aircraft is to be able to change the direction of the engine nozzles. This means that they will not be adding extra mass for more engines, but it does mean they've added complexity with moving parts. But added complexity seems like a good trade-off in order to have less mass. And speaking of mass, the engineers will have to keep a very close eye on the center of mass of this aircraft. The engine nozzles will need to be positioned in such a way that no matter which direction they're pointed, the thrust vector will always go through the center of mass. When building a fighter, the wings tend to be a little differently shaped than other aircraft. That is because a greater emphasis is placed on maneuverability. The center of aerodynamic pressure will be in almost the same place as the center of mass. And this aircraft will have some extra considerations as well, as it will need to be able to fly well in forward flight and in a hover. The large control surfaces should help the aircraft fly better when it is flying at very low speeds. This odd looking tube structure on the back of the aircraft will be used to help balance the center of mass. Besides just moving wing parts forward and backwards, their angle can also be changed in order to move the position of the center of aerodynamic pressure. The main wings have been rotated in order to give this aircraft a fairly high angle of incidence. Besides just moving the entire wing, individual wing pieces can be adjusted to change the flight characteristics of the aircraft. The main wings are also tilted down to give them an anhedral shape. This will help the plane be more maneuverable and it will also be a place to attach landing gear out on the sides. Technically, this aircraft is using more of a bicycle arrangement for its landing gear. The angle of the nozzle is being bound to a Cal 1000. One could just bind the angle of the hinges directly to an action group, but by binding them to the Cal 1000, I'm able to quickly adjust the angle here in the hangar. Some mass is added to the rear of the aircraft to help balance the center of mass. At a hover, and very low speeds, the control surfaces of the aircraft will be practically useless, so some compressed air nozzles are added all over the aircraft to give it roll, pitch, and yaw control. As engineers add the compressed air nozzles, they are also very mindful of the torque readout. They want that engine torque very close to zero. Now that the first prototype has been assembled, Jebediah Kerman bravely volunteers to be the first test pilot. He runs through his checklist to make sure everything's working, points the nozzles down, and throttles up. Around 90% throttle, he is able to lift the plane off the ground. He makes liberal use of the compressed air nozzles to delicately control the aircraft. Carefully, he flies through the north hangar. Turning the aircraft is a little tricky in hover mode. If he were to roll the aircraft too far, he would lose control and the aircraft would roll over and crash. But as long as he keeps the aircraft pretty level, he should be alright. Jebediah now begins transitioning over to forward flight. As the speed increases, the craft handles more like a regular airplane. Once again, he rotates the engine nozzles down and transitions over to hover mode. Jeb has radioed in that he intends to fly through the south hangar now. Apparently, he gets a kick out of barnstorming these hangars. Since he can do this in the Talon, this has got to seem pretty easy to him. Just so everyone knows, Jeb radios back that this is not as easy as it looks. After flying through the hangar, Jeb transitions to forward flight. While not designed to go supersonic, the aircraft should approach Mach 1. 
Jeb says that the aircraft feels very nimble. Given all of the trade-offs in making an aircraft like this, it should still be very capable as a fighter. The plane will still need further testing to see how it handles a combat load. But so far, the initial test flight appears to be a success. All that's left is for Jebediah to bring the aircraft in for a landing. And after landing, there is one more aircraft for Jebediah to test today. Another new jet fighter has secretly been in development. The Seacan Navy has commissioned the development of a high-performance heavy fighter. But rather than having engines that can rotate, this plane has wings that can rotate. Jebediah carefully eases the aircraft over the runway, gently sets it down, and this test flight looks like a success. But Jebediah's fun for the day is not over. Also in development is the Central Crobat Alliance Network's very first variable sweep wing aircraft. Developed in tandem with the fighter are the new AIM-54 long-range missiles. This new K-14 has been developed as a replacement for the venerable K-4 fighter aircraft. Now that he's over the water, Jebediah decides to test to see just how fast this aircraft can go. He sweeps the wings back and lights the afterburners. Jeb and Johnny scream past Mach 1. And, in short order, they are now faster than Mach 2. At these speeds, Jebediah has to be very careful that he doesn't bank the aircraft too fast. Otherwise, he and Johnny might pass out from the G-forces. The aircraft can handle sustained turns over 10 Gs, but Jeb and Johnny cannot. As Jebediah and Johnny approach the island airfield, they sweep the wings forward again. Sweeping the wings forward makes the aircraft more maneuverable. Sweeping the wings forward moves the center of aerodynamic pressure forward, so the aircraft is able to pitch a little easier. So far, Jebediah and Johnny are very impressed with this aircraft. Jebediah believes that this aircraft may become the iconic symbol of his piloting and tactics school. And with that, the first test flight of the K-14 is in the books. And, while an impressive aircraft, its development has come too late for use in the Southeast Kerbin conflict. The last CCAN personnel are departing from Southeast Kerbin. Many are disappointed with how the conflict has concluded. Communist forces are poised to assume control over the entire region. And while there's plenty of room for finger pointing, it's undeniable that the research and development arm of the Central Kerbin Alliance Network has made great strides during this time period. Great leaps forward have been made in helicopter development, jet development, and in exploration of space. Let it not be forgotten that during this time period, Kerbals went to Duna multiple times and returned back to Kerbin. Will the communists feel emboldened by their success in Southeast Kerbin? Or what new conflicts will arise on the planet? Only time will tell. It may not even be the communists, but other smaller nations may feel emboldened to challenge the Central Kerbin Alliance Network. With every challenge, the research and development arm of the Central Kerbin Alliance Network continues to rise to the occasion. The Space Center hopes to continue taking Kerbal Kine to new heights. And with these two new fighter jets, the Central Kerbin Alliance Network should be able to face any new challenges that come its way. And what's this? Scientists monitoring the Mariner probes have just discovered something. They've picked up an anomaly near Duna's South Pole. It could be that there's some kind of radio signal emitting from the location. Therefore, another mission to the Red Planet is in order. I am Echo 3, and thanks for joining me on this discussion about the Cold War. I will see you next time.